the verification process. Uh, there are two very uh, important and separated steps uh, in, this, in this process. Uh, one is uh, the uh, assessment of monitoring plan, and the second is the verification of uh, the uh, emission reports. So the top part of the uh, of the slide shows the uh, monitoring plan uh, uh, assessment, and uh, it's the same philosophy of process for both assessment of plan and verification of report, but the assessment of plan has to be done uh, before uh, the start of the monitoring period, and it has to be done uh, only once. So the initial stage is to engage a verifier. So this work has to be done under a contract, which uh, explains what is the scope and what would be the outcome, uh, what would be the outcome of the process, what regulation will be used, and, and, and so on. So this first part is the draft of MRV monitoring plan, uh, which is followed by the request uh, of documents by the verifier. So basically the process is iterative and we need documents to confirm that what you say in the monitoring plan is correct. It can be uh, technical documents about processes and procedures. It can also be some administrative information about the uh, name of the ship, its IMO number, and so on. I would assume that uh, most of the ship operators uh, or managers or charterers are aware with monitoring plan obligation because this has been in place for some years now and uh, the name of monitoring plan for uh, IMO DCS is the same. <clears throat> so once the plan has been approved, the, the monitoring of the data can be done. Uh, and for year N, the monitoring lasts from 1st of January to 31st of, of December. Uh, monitoring has to be done on a regular basis, usually daily, uh, during the year. And what has to be monitored is the fuel uh, consumed, the distance sailed, uh, the time at sea, uh, and the um, cargo quantity on board for MRV requirements. Uh, for IMO, it's only operational parameters, uh, and cargo is not uh, considered. At the end of the year, the operator can submit a draft emission report, so basically a list of all voyages which have been performed during the year, uh, the ports of uh, departure arrival, uh, and the corresponding data, so fuel consumed by fuel type, uh, corresponding CO2 emissions, total distance uh, for the EU MRV voyages for the year, and total uh, time at sea, and total transport work. This report uh, is verified by the verifier, and this step here is the uh, biggest one of the verification process because the verifier will redo uh, the uh, calculation of the emission report based on the data submitted by, by the operator to confirm it is coherent, to confirm that it's statistically uh, correct, and uh, there is also a cross-check with document sample, so the BDN, for example, uh, or it can be a cargo manifest, it can be copies of uh, logbooks. Uh, the document can vary, but the idea is to confirm that what was provided in the data format is matching with the documentation uh, on, board, on board the ship. Once this process is done, the report can be submitted on TETIS MRV, and TETIS MRV is a very important system because uh, this is where the uh, document of compliance can be uh, collected. So submit the report on TETIS MRV operator, then verification comments uh, and verification conclusion is entered on TETIS MRV by the verifier, and then the electronic MRV uh, document of compliance can be uh, can be downloaded and has to be on board uh, of the ship by the end of June of the following year. So you. For the year 2022, monitoring is in progress, and by the end of June 2023, you will have to have the MRV document of compliance for the year 2022. The, the big step, which is not currently in the system, but which is coming in, in the next years, uh, maybe based on 2024 data, depending on how the legal process uh, uh, occurs is the surrendering of uh, allowance uh, under the EU MRV. Uh, 
of, of emissions monitor under EU MRV. So this is basically inclusion of shipping under the emission trading system. And for every ton of CO2 emitted uh, under the EU MRV uh, scope, uh, uh, the shipping company will have to buy uh, carbon allowance from the EU ETS market and will have to surrender that allowance uh, in, the, in the following year. So there would be financial implications because the price of one ton of CO2 currently is about 80 euros. Uh, so for a ship emitting 10,000 tons, uh, the compliance uh, in terms of cost will be uh, huge. And there are also massive penalties in case of non-compliance. That's it for a very quick overview of the verification flow process. It's uh, very data intensive. And this step, uh, data collection and, and the review of operation documents is uh, a very important one, where the use of uh, IT systems uh, is very helpful and, and allows a much more efficient compliance process. You can give a discount. And what discount can you give to our members if they're going to use your company? Uh, yes, of course. So uh, Verifavia is, uh, as I said, we conduct uh, independent verification services, so audits under EU MRV and IM ODCS. And we are also approved by uh, uh, the National Accreditation Body of uh, UCAS, uh, which is uh, administering the UK MRV program. So we are happy to be a one uh, stop shop for all uh, MRV compliance. Uh, and uh, IMODCS compliance uh, programs, uh, we uh, can offer a discount of 10% uh, on our services uh, when it comes to the members of, of North. We would be uh, happy to also collaborate with you on uh, independent verification of uh, other programs like Clean Shipping Index and like uh, EXI. Uh, we have also developed uh, recently a system uh, that aims at uh, monitoring compliance with a carbon intensity indicator, so one of the upcoming IMODCS requirements, which uh, which uh, will be more stringent with the years. So we believe it's very important to monitor regularly uh, operational data uh, to be able to react uh, uh, quickly if you see that you're uh, going to be a bit above the CII threshold for that chip, maybe it would be good to uh, adjust or, or operate the ship at a bit of a, of a lower speed for the upcoming voyage in order to limit the risk of uh, being uh, non-compliant with, uh, with a rate C or, or rate D uh, for, for, for the ship. So feel free to contact me after this webinar. I'll be happy to provide more details and, and put you in touch with, uh, with our technical, uh, technical team. Okay, thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, we'll move on to the next slide, what? which I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think there are some issues with your microphone. It's not very easy to understand the, when you when okay. you speak. Uh, I'm not sure if yeah. I'm the only one with the with the issue. Yeah, I think I know what. Is that better? Yes, I think it's much better now. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, Right, the next part of the presentation, we're going to pass. Thank you, Nicholas. We're going to pass over to Piyush now. And if you could uh, go through the implementation workflow and anything from there, please. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mark, and thank uh, Nicholas uh, for uh, giving a high level uh, overview on uh, how the verification is done. And uh, you did mention uh, that uh, technology is going to help uh, the ship owner operators uh, in ensuring that the compliance is uh, met as we inch towards uh, uh, 2023. So here is a implementation uh, uh, workflow, which uh, as a technology company, uh, uh, we are uh, su uh, suggesting. Uh, so before I go to that, uh, to our implementation workflow, just wanted to quickly tell you who we are. Uh, so we are, uh, technology company who are supported by uh, uh, shipping industry leaders. Uh, Andreas Soman Pau uh, from BW, Michael Spo from uh, Hafnia, Rajesh Oni from Synergy, and uh, Nisin Kayun, uh, uh, Captain Abe. 
they are the people who are backing us and keep us honest about what is the most uh, recent pain point. And uh, we look at creating solutions which are going to help you on ground uh, addressing those issues. So one of the things uh, which we did is that we had a quick look at uh, what is required currently. So while uh, you know that uh, the EDI uh, uh, developed into the EEXI, which is now required for uh, your January 2023 requirements, which is only an entry ticket, but subsequently going forward, you will need to look very closely at uh, your operational uh, KPI, uh, uh, which is uh, via monitoring or AER and ensuring that your CII ratings are uh, within control. Also the EOI, which might be relevant uh, uh, going forward and then submitting the compliance reports as uh, there could be a need subsequently. So when we looked at these uh, midterm and uh, long term requirements, we also looked at what could be uh, the pain points which we are hearing from our uh, customers and our stakeholders. And uh, when we look at that, uh, we see issues in primarily four buckets uh, where one is there's a lot of time and effort going in collating data, which is currently might be coming from your known reports or various logs. The second is on the data quality side where you have gaps uh, in many cases for voice data, especially towards the end and the beginning uh, does not reconcile with uh, the ROBs uh, on board. The communication itself uh, between various systems to uh, collate the data at one place and provide it uh, in a complete fashion to the verifier so that they can uh, perform their job in one go. And then last but very importantly also, uh, when you have multiple places to report the same information, how do you ensure that the data is consistent across uh, uh, various places where you submit the same information? So looking at uh, all these uh, pain points, we uh, looked at creating a tool uh, which is the smart Voyager emissions and the implementation workflow uh, here is uh, demonstrating that. What it means is we are looking at collating your voice wise data. So when you look at information which is coming from uh, the ship, you have a simple method via email to provide voice ROB information at the beginning of the voice and at the end of the voice to a central system which does the calculation as per the requirements of uh, respective KPIs, uh, be it uh, AAR and CII or EOI. But very importantly, before that, there are certain validations uh, which are run, and these validations help your data to be. Uh, calculated and providing you more accurate uh, KPIs as you use them in various places. Once this calculation is done, uh, you have uh, dashboards available, which gives you easy insights, and then you have a single click output in terms of reports. So for example, if you have to give a .csv output so to see cargo charter, it can generate a .csv output for each voice in a single row, which can be sent directly. And uh, similarly, if you have to send it, uh, as we just heard from uh, Nicholas, uh, as an annual data exchange to the verifier so that it can be used subsequently as we head to 2024 uh, for subsequent uh, verification and certification as needs. So, so this is the this is a very quick overview of uh, the workflow. Of course, uh, uh, going forward, uh, I would also show you a quick demo and uh, how different uh, screens look like. Uh, so we'll go there next, but uh, I think this is the first part, Mark. Uh, I hope uh, uh, this helps. Yeah, that, that's great. Thanks, Piyush. Um, I just quickly want to, just before you um, go into your demo, if you could just quickly discuss the discount that's available for members if they were to, to you know, use your platform and, and what options are available for them, please. Please. 
Sure. So maybe what I'll do, I, I'll, I'll quickly uh, uh, share my screen and uh, run uh, uh, the details from there. So let me quickly share my screen. So here is a, a, a quick detail. Uh, we have uh, recently introduced this platform of Smart Voyager Emissions, where we are running uh, free trials for the first 2,500 ships, and it is going to be available from July 1st. Uh, and uh, we intend to uh, keep it till December 2022 uh, completely free. Uh, the purpose is that we get more of your feedback on what are your pain points and how uh, this can be improved further. We have currently about 900 ships, and if you need more uh, information on this, you can uh, visit our website or you can reach out to your uh, North representative or Mark or me, and we can take. Uh, that is where that is uh, very quickly uh, uh, Mark what it is, and in order to show what uh, you get in this, perhaps I'll take you to the demo. Uh, shall we go there, Mark? Now? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. All right. So. In the Smart Voyager uh, emissions current uh, uh, application, you would be able to uh, look at uh, the EOI calculation, uh, CII, and uh, a dashboard which can uh, pull in your EXI information and show you at uh, one place. And then you have a single click output uh, where you can slice and dice the data in various ways to provide report and uh, output to different entities as needs so be. And then you have uh, uh, dashboards which can provide you uh, insight. So let me uh, quickly uh, uh, take you uh, to the demo part. So if you look at the screen, uh, this is the current landing page of uh, uh, the application. What you see here is actually a lot of uh, information. Each row is a single voice which includes details of when the voyage had started, ended, when it has been submitted, uh, different KPIs, EOI, AER, uh, details of uh, the voyage, what has been emitted in ballast laden cases, and uh, subsequently more details about what has been the distance uh, traveled and the uh, different uh, consumptions of different type of fuels. What is uh, good uh, about uh, such a, a dashboard is you can very quickly slice and dice the information to get uh, a specific information. For example, if you want to look at, say, a specific charter, uh, uh, you can type the name and then uh, what you see here on top uh, is the EOI for all voyages which has been done for uh, this specific charter. You have similar filters available for say year to date or uh, uh, last three months if you're looking from a performance perspective, or you can also select uh, a calendar menu out here. Uh, so this is showing you the KPI from EOI perspective, but uh, if you would like to see, for example, CII uh, rating, you can click on again all the vessels. Uh, this is for FMG. So it is showing what is the year to date uh, attained value and how the projections are going forward. It's easy to download uh, this data you know, in a simple uh, table, which you can uh, use it elsewhere if uh, need so be. So this, this makes it uh, very simple to use. Adding ships on this platform is easy. You can simply add uh, the IMO number and the email IDs uh, uh, for the ship and the shore, and the rest of the information uh, is collated. Uh, you can request the vessel to send an emission report after adding it right from here. And once the uh, data is uh, on the platform, each of these uh, boys information could be. Could be reviewed by uh, somebody who is at the shore, you know, one more time from the perspective of uh, validation. So you should be able to see uh, details out here. And uh, if uh, you need a second eye from the from a sole person, they can look at the information here, cargo breakup, transport work, and it is also possible to edit this uh, so as to ensure that before it is sent to the verifier or for reporting purposes, uh, there has been a second up, uh, approval done by a relevant person. 
then the system allows to send the emission report uh, via email or you can choose to download a specific uh, a format and again these are customizable this would be available like a workbench which uh, uh, you can use to uh, download or send in a specific format so that is very quickly what uh, is available in the uh, uh, in the demo of the platform which we have currently uh, it generates a report which uh, looks uh, something like this where uh, this is a PDF copy and you can generate similar reports to be sent to others. These are the dashboards for you know the CII and uh, this is for the EXI part. Right and uh, then going forward uh, we also as you heard from uh, the verification uh, Nicholas was mentioning that uh, perhaps it is also important to understand and know uh, what needs to be done if you have your vessel under a specific uh, CII rating. So this dashboard will also give you a quick uh, insight into uh, where the improvement can be done. So in some cases you would be able to perhaps look at the operational profile and improve uh, the performance, but maybe in other cases uh, you would need to look at uh, uh, the hull cleaning or uh, maybe at the design level some appendages need to be done. So the dashboard will also give you uh, insight going forward into these areas so that uh, you can improve on that. OK, thank you, Piers. That's, uh, that's excellent. For some reason, the presentation keeps on uh, dropping out. There's a few technical difficulties here, but anyway, if it drops out again, we can do without it. Um, we'll just keep it on here. I was just going to put up here, basically showing the questions, the contacts for anybody. So if anybody wants to ask any technical questions on any of this after the webinar, then then please um, let us know. Now there's another question coming here. How is the data input ensure managed to verify the quality? How do you quality control the data? Right, so there are uh, some quality measures or validations right in the beginning. So when we ingest your data, there are uh, boundary conditions uh, depending on the ship type and sizes. So we start with uh, that information and then subsequently as uh, data starts coming in, uh, the system. And, uh, there is a file created for your vessel. So that goes into looking at uh, validation of your uh, consumption data. For the data regarding your distance, uh, we have uh, the AIS information we, which we use. OK, thank you. Thanks, Piers. Um, any more questions, please feel free to fire them in. In the meantime, we've got some questions which were asked during the registration process. As I said before, that's great, and thank you very much for the questions. So the first question we have here, is how do ship owners buy these credits? Where are the credits stored and how are they deposited for voyages? And the answer to that is it's to open an account with the union registry so they can buy, transfer, surrender allowances, which will remain in the designated registered account until transferred or surrendered. I'm going to ask Nicholas to elaborate on that point, but just before I do so, I just want to put another question out there, which I think is is more for Nicholas as well, and that's really talking about: Is it one of the one of the attendees for this webinar said, is it going to be a problem if we were to report the bunkers for the 2020 period as HFO, while last year they were reported as LFO selected because of the sulfur content, even though they were your RMG 380. The only point I want to add to this is the importance of getting the bunker data correct on the bunker delivery note. There's going to be a huge focus on this because of the emission factors, but really I think it's it's over to Nicholas to elaborate on how you would deal with that um, from your angle, please, Nicholas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So, I mean, indeed, it is true critical uh, to get the correct information uh, in terms of the type of fuel uh, because the emission factor will vary with the fuel type and so uh, the idea of the verification is to have some uh, reasonable assurance that the data is correct so 
if, uh, I mean, and we will look into the BDN in particular in order to identify the fuel type and in order to make sure that the fuel type indicated in the system uh, or in the data reported and the emission factor are correct. Uh, if a mistake has been made in the past and the thing has been already uh, verified, uh, it's too late uh, to act and not much will happen. Uh, but of course, uh, the, there should be uh, in continuous improvement so that the errors uh, which have been made in the past and, and identified uh, do not uh, do not occur again. So indeed, the uh, fuel typology is is going to be uh, scrutinized a lot more uh, in, in in the coming uh, in the coming months, and uh, it it will be more and more important to. Uh, get the correct data because uh, errors in the data will result in, in potential penalties. So uh, having said that, uh, we have uh, in, in the verification uh, world, we have the concept of materiality, which is basically evaluating the impact of a mistake over the total uh, carbon emissions reported or fuel or, or distance, whatever. So. Uh, verifiers can uh, evaluate what is the impact of this error to uh, evaluate what is the impact on the total CO2 reported to justify whether or not uh, a correction is requested to the operator because it may not be required in some cases to ask for a, a correction that will request many uh, uh, analysis of data or many correction of data when the impact on the overall ton of CO2 reported is 0.5 percent. But it's up to every verification companies and, and to some extent to every individual verifier based on their knowledge and on their perception of the uh, of the error to, to justify this in the verification process. So that's it on the on the first question on, on fuel types, but but indeed uh, incorrect fuel type is a, is a common problem and something that will be uh, looked at with even more scrutiny in, in the future. When it comes to the second question about uh, carbon allowances, so so basically you should think of your carbon uh, allowance account like a, like a bank account. Uh, and first thing to to do for you will be to open a bank account. Uh, and uh, or to open a carbon account. Uh, and to open it, you will need to provide uh, some documents to confirm identity. Uh, you have also to provide a, a, a ju judiciary records and things like that. Uh, so in some cases, these documents have to be translated because you will have to open a registry account in the country uh, uh, to which you have been uh, allocated. So every, if you're uh, ISM company and you're based in EU member states, then you will have to open an account in, in, I mean, you will be administered by the authority of that member state and you will have to uh, open a registry on that, uh, in, that, uh, in that country. And it, so you may need to provide a translated version of documents. If you're a company outside uh, Europe, uh, then the European uh, uh, Commission will, will allocate you or your ships to a country, European member state, depending on the most frequent port visited, I think, in the last uh, in the last two years. Uh, once you have this bank account open, you need to contact a trader uh, who will uh, provide you with uh, allowances that you can then uh, use to surrender every year. So you buy allowance. I mean, you buy whenever you want, but every year, for each ton of CO2 emitted under EU MRV, you will have to, to, to surrender, to give back an allowance to the, uh, via the carbon registry account to the administering authority. And if you don't, there will be, uh, there will be, uh, there will be some penalties. What is also very important uh, is to adhere to the legal timeline. And currently we see that there is um, there are some issues and some companies are facing difficulties to meet the regulatory timeline and that's the day of today for MRV. There is no uh, uh, penalty for missing uh, deadline, except that you don't have the document of compliance, but it, so problems come if you are inspected by port state control. But there is no uh, systematic penalty in case of late compliance, but this will come into the picture 
with uh, ETS. And so it's important to, uh, to um, comply on time. Uh, so I, I noticed some question on the chat and maybe I'll, I'll answer this. Uh, so have North of England considered their position in regards to cover for members in terms of new regulations? So for UK, there is a dedicated program that has been enforced and that uh, started at the beginning of this year. So uh, it's a UK MRV for now. Uh, and if you have a ship that sells to a UK port, you must have a approved monitoring plan covering also UK requirements. So, and if you don't have that in place, if your ship is inspected by UK port sale control, uh, it's, it's a non-compliance. And by the end of this year, uh, ships are expected to report their UK MRV emissions uh, to the UK uh, to the UK uh, government. Uh, they are in the process of putting in place uh, a web platform where, where that would be mandatory for reporting, a bit similar to TETIS, but uh, UK uh, uh, UK versions. Uh, I see a question from Zedip on fuel types. Shall I take it, uh, Mark? Or... Yes, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, so there, are, there is a lot of confusion among operators regarding name, grade, type of fuel, although there have been explanatory notes about parties. I think that we made some simple, clear explanation between LFO, LSFO to be shared with ship owners. Uh, yeah, I mean, I fully agree. Some uh, further clarification are fully required also so that all verification bodies uh, take the same uh, stand when it comes to, to fuel uh, grades. Uh, this some yeah, I agree that some uh, uh, further and uh, clarification from authorities to limit interpretation by individual verifier would be, would be very would be very helpful. Yes, maybe I can just add there further. Uh, perhaps as of now, till the time you have the RN grade mentioned on the BDN. The viscosity uh, as per 8 ISO 8217, I think that uh, should be your uh, guideline for identifying the type of fuel. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And um, maybe I can add on that to. I mean, there are also other regulations coming uh, for Europe, and in particular, fuel EU maritime. And under fuel EU maritime, uh, it's going to be mandatory to, to basically monitor not only the the type of fuel, but also the origin of the fuel uh, with more, more details. So uh, the same type of fuel coming from a different place in the world may have different uh, emission factor, and this will bring in some uh, added complexity. So m monitoring correctly the fuel type is going to become increasingly important, and, and this is why using uh, systems uh, trying to benefit from uh, internal checks, uh, from uh, currency checks, uh, and facilitating the reporting, the aggregation of voyages for EU MRV, for UK MRV, uh, facilitating the aggregation of voyages into the uh, into the annual report is something that is very important. And we see that there are, there is a multiplication of re legal requirements every year. There, there are new things, and if you have one system. Uh, where you centralize all data related to fuel emissions and voyages, uh, then it, it makes the uh, compliance uh, a lot more efficient. And you can expect in the future that uh, there will be only more and more requirements related to emissions and, and fuel. Okay, thank you. Um, there's, there's another question coming there, Nicholas, so it might be Nicholas or PU who may want to deal with that, but if you don't, then we can, can look at it ourselves. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can uh, try to, to, to answer. So uh, it's, a, uh, no, it's a good question. Uh, what I mentioned is the, the, the simple approach via broker. So you need to, to only open uh, carbon registry account, and then you, you don't purchase uh, allowances yourself on the market you request a broker to purchase it for you and the broker will purchase at a agreed price and will then put these allowances on your carbon account and then you are responsible for it. There are various uh, market products uh, when it comes to allowances like in the stock market, which I know nothing about or not much, but I know these exist and you can have future, you have options, uh, you have 
you, you can use many different trading strategies. Maybe you want to buy today a lot because you are sure the price will increase in the next years. Maybe you want to have uh, uh, some uh, yearly adjustment during the year, depending on how your ships travel and so on. So, or maybe you will not do nothing and wait for the last minute to buy uh, allowances uh, just when you need them, when you have the exact amount. But if you do that, then maybe you will pay a bit more. So there are lots of strategies and the broker uh, can uh, help you figure out what is the best strategy for you. And what uh, is the question is about basically uh, being uh, cleared uh, to be able to buy uh, allowances directly on the market. And, and basically, in order to do that, of course, you have a very ex extensive KYC process, but not only, uh, you have to, to basically become a trader. So you have to, to justify uh, you have to have a diploma or you have to have someone in your team that is an experienced broker uh, to, to justify that you are legitimate to have uh, an account. Uh, but it's more a broker account. It's not uh, just a carbon trader account. It's a broker account. And then you can go into the market and, and, and buy allowances or sell allowances. Um, so the process to become approved uh, to be a broker is, is of course, much longer, uh, but it's not only KYC. It's, it's my understanding is that there are also some competency requirements and you have to pass an exam, I think, uh, to then become approved on, on these, uh, to be a carbon, uh, carbon broker. And it's not specific to shipping. Huh? I mean, then you can be carbon broker for aviation is in ETS for 10 years and fixed installations. And there are plans to include other sectors as well. So it, it could be uh, an interesting uh, business opportunity, but uh, it, it's not uh, specific to, to, to shipping. It's more really being a broker and being a trader. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, Maria um, Bork, the, the question about the, the north of England there as well. We, we'll contact you separately about that um, from our P&I department, but uh, it's in very early stages at the moment, and, and that's what we would say on that. So we'll, we'll contact you on that separately from this. Um, one very quick question that we received as well before I hand over to Helen. Helen's got a couple of questions to go through. Um, was on the, how will the ETS be st structured? And then will there be um, any allowance? It, any allowances for STS operations. Now, our understanding is that STS operations, just as transshipment, may be a form of carbon leakage. And obviously, there's various different, um, you know, research gone into this effectively to find out, you know, the distance traveled to the next port of the transshipment. But it's all to be decided in the future and our understanding is that it's not really been decided yet but the, well, the one point we really want to bring across is that there's going to be a definite drive to avoid carbon leakage which means that STS operations to try and bypass the EU ETS allowances may be frowned upon as we move forward to the next stage but that will come into the future and we'll hopefully have more guidance on that later. Um, with that, then, I'm going to hand over to Helen. Helen's got a couple of contractual questions to answer. If I could pass over to you now, please, Helen, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, <clears throat> so for anyone who hasn't attended these webinars before or worked with me, I'm Helen Barden, a senior solicitor in North's FD&D team. And I work predominantly with UK, US and European members um, and I'm on North's decarbonisation working group. Um, I'm also part of the BIMCO Carbon Clauses Drafting Committee, uh, which has so far produced the EXI Transition Clause and the Emission Trading Scheme Allowances Clause. Um, so as Mark mentioned, we've had a few questions submitted as part of the um, registration process. So the first one um, I've been asked to address is how important is the data in a legal or charter party context as between owners and charterers? Um, so Nicola and Piyush have already highlighted the importance of um, accurate documentation and data for submission under the IMO DCS and the EU MRV. 
uh, but accuracy of data is important for both the charters and owners as well as the ship managers. So um, in a legal or charter party context, the main points are that the ultimate obligations are obviously on the owners under the regulations, um, but to the extent that they need to pass any costs. So, for example, under the upcoming ETS um, directive as it goes ahead um, down to charterers or the need to pass any element of compliance. Um, so, for example, under the CII regulations down to charterers, um, then that should be provided for in the charter party. Um, and I think inaccurate data could be very problematic for owners and charterers trying to meet their charter party obligations. So with the CII um, regulations, for example, I think that the data transparency, transparency is going to be absolutely essential and it's going to be required on a continual basis so that charterers can actually understand the impact their orders are having on the vessel CII um, and if necessary better understand the need for any corrective actions that might need to be taken um, under the upcoming EU ETS. Um, the charterers are going to want to ensure that the owners emissions data and calculations are correct for the purpose of ascertaining uh, the correct amount of allowances where the cost is going to be passed down the charter chain um, and that seems to be the basis upon which um, the expectation is anyway under the current draft of the um, directive and it's also the basis upon which the um, BIMCO emission trading scheme allowances clause um, has been drafted. Which also then leads me quickly on to the next question. Um, Please explain the new BIMCO Emission Trading Scheme Allowance Clause for Time Charter Parties 2022 and the impl implication of including it in a charter party. Um, so briefly, the, the purpose of the clause is to allocate the cost and responsibilities for obtaining, transferring and surrendering um, greenhouse gas emission allowances for ships operating under an emission trading scheme. So it's wider than just the EU ETS. It's supposed to catch other similar um, schemes as well. Also, um, the current understanding is that the requirement to surrender these allowances won't be until the following year. So it was thought that for owners to have to wait until that point before that they can obtain the um, cost or recover the cost or obtain the allowances from charters, that would be a very large credit risk. So the clause provides for um, the allowances to be given by charters to owners on a more regular basis to reduce that credit risk. And then there is also the remedy um, under the subclause D to do with withholding performance where charters haven't provided the allowances that they're supposed to be. Um, if the clause is not in the charter party, then depending on the terms of the charter party, there may be arguments that owners can try and run to pass those costs down to charterers. Um, but I, that's obviously not clear. So having an express clause will be preferable. Um, and I think the closer we get to the regulations, if there isn't a term in the charter party, I think it'll be more difficult for the owners um, to potentially pass those costs down. And if we've got time, Mark, <laughs> the final question um, that we had through was um, how do the vessel speed and consumption warranties come into play with regards to the upcoming regulations? So um, under a time charter party, there will usually be warranties given by the owners regarding the vessel's um, speed and given consumption and that's usually given on an about basis to provide for a margin and in certain good weather. Um, but if the owners are in breach of those, um, oblig uh, in breach of the speed and consumption warranty, then that will entitle the charterers to claim damages. So with the upcoming regulations, which are obviously very focused on um, vessel efficiency and uh, consumption of fuel, there is, of course, an intrinsic link with the um, speed and consumption warranties. Um, an example of this just quickly is the EXI regulations. So um, where the owners have to bring their ships to a specific technical level, 
and that may well be done by, for example, engine power limitation or shaft power limitation, then the knock-on effect may be that the warranted maximum speed is actually um, no longer achievable. And so the BIMCO EXI transition clause allows the owners to amend that warranted maximum speed um, once the modification has been carried out. The point just to mention in that respect is that whilst the speed is maybe um, amended, the ship's performance curve shouldn't change. So um, that should provide comfort to um, to the charterers. And I think that's probably all I have time to say on those questions, Mark. So um, I will pass back to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you, Piyush, and thank you, Nicholas. Um, all excellent discussion points there. So it looks like we've either covered all of the questions asked before the webinar, we've covered the questions asked during the webinar or some that we're going to go back to the separate parties about. Um, so it looks as though really we've uh, we've done everything we wanted to do today. And I just want to say thank you to all of you again. Thank you to everybody for coming along to the webinar. Um, please feel free to reach out to Piers, Nicholas, Helen, myself, any of us to ask any questions on any, any of this. We'll be following up with a, a what we call a follow-up package, which will be the slides from the presentation, a recording of the video, and the contact details of, of all of us, should you have any more questions. Thank you as well for the interesting questions. It's only through these questions that we get to find out what ship owners are, are really asking about this subject. So it's good for us to see, and it helps us to answer our next questions and perhaps provide material and guidance to everybody. So unless I have any objections, any shout outs from the floor or from anywhere else, I just really want to say thank you to everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and please feel free to get in touch with us at any time. Thanks a lot. Goodbye and take care. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.